Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to State of the World and this special edition of State of the World on the uh, rise and fall of the Super League with our special guests today, um, Dr. Stefan Szymanski, uh, sports management professor at the University of Michigan, acclaimed author um, and uh, soccer economist or football economist, Stefan, I should probably say. Um, and our special guest, uh, Harry Watling, the head coach of the Howard Athletic right here in our community. And today's uh, discussion is going to be moderated by the one and only Amanda Jolly, our VP of Communications and Programming here at the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. This discussion and discussions like it at State of the World couldn't be possible without generous support and today our event is being supported by Mr. Jeffrey Hoffman in the Hoffman Auto Group. Um, so definitely check them out. Uh, and we are so grateful for your support, Mr. Hoffman. So without further ado, Amanda, take it away. Thank you so much, Megan, um, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I also want to um, thank our partners at Hartford Athletic for uh, joining us in today's discussion. And um, it's fantastic not only to have their partnership on today's event, but also to have their um, incredible team here in the uh, Hartford community. So we're so lucky. And that brings me to the introduction of our first speaker today. Um, and I am thrilled to have Harry here, the head coach of the Hartford Athletic. And Harry, I wanna throw it over to you asking the essential question uh, we're going to dive deeper into some of the nuts and bolts, some of the global forces that are at work here with the Super League. Um, and at the outset, Harry, can you just tell us what was your first reaction when you heard about the creation of the Super League? I know a lot of it was done in shadow and then it was made this dramatic announcement. What was your first reaction um, and what do you make of this attempt? Um, first of all, Amanda, Megan, thank you for obviously inviting us on and it's a pleasure to be on here with, with Stefan as well. What was my reaction to the Super League? So I always like to take into account both sides and like to listen and, and, and feel what both sides are thinking. So after much deliberation and understanding it, I, I wasn't a fan. And the reason why I wasn't a fan was the romantic in me, the football romantic of everything just being locked in. So if you take into consideration those teams that were going to lock themselves in from a business perspective for their owners, it was a great idea because it guaranteed them potentially a set amount of income, you know, a set amount of TV rights, et cetera, et cetera. So from a business perspective, brilliant. From a football perspective, you know, the fact that if you take into consideration that they were only going to allow a certain amount of teams potentially to participate and there was going to be teams that were always guaranteed that spot, that leaves out, and I'm sure you remember Leicester winning the Premier League a few years ago. What would have happened to a team like that? Could they have participated in, in that or, or not? Sport in Lisbon have just won the Portuguese top division for the first time in, I think, 20 years. Inter Milan have just won the Italian league for the first time in 11 seasons. So you take into consideration that the little man or the underdog in this scenario, and it, it doesn't lend itself to that. And I always cast my mind back to when I was a boy when I first walked into my first football stadium, which was in South East London um, at Millwall Football Club. And I got that feeling when I walked, walked in and I'd see the players warming up. And my, my dad said to me, one day Millwall could get into the Premier League. Now he was wrong because we can't, we're, we're not there yet. But it's just that hope of potentially getting to the next level. And if you get to the Premier League, which they call the promised land, it's, then can you get into the Champions League? And, you know, just having that, that tournament, which is a closed shop, it wasn't something that I was a big fan of down to those points. Um, excellent. Thank you so much. And Harry, last question for you before we, um, uh, before we bring in Stefan is I know the Hartford Athletic is off to an incredible start this season. So for everyone out there, how is the season going? And can you just give us a little, uh, a little insight into the Hartford Athletic team? Yeah, for sure. So let me start off with pre-season. So pre-season, we had quite a lot of new faces come in. We retained six players from last year. Um, and then the other 18 were fresh, fresh faces. So the first challenge for me was to address the culture and the culture that I wanted. 
the club to have. Um, and my my mantra, if you like, is person first, player second, and team third. Because I think if I can understand the person, then I can help them become a better player. And if I can make them become a better player, we'll get a better team. So it's person, player, team. The culture that we that we have now is, is you know it's really healthy. We push each other. We come in, you know, we're in every day, we're working hard, but we have good people here. So pre-season went really well. We ticked a lot of boxes that we wanted to tick. We played an MLS club in pre-season. We played New York City FC. Um, we got beat 2-0. We were fantastic in the second half. And we were, you know, we kept the rest of pre-season unbeaten. We approached the season with two road games, away games. New York Red Bulls 2, where we won 3-2. First game in management for myself. We had a lot of players unavailable down to injury. Um, so actually only had two players on the bench. So for us, it was a big win. Then we go away to Miami, um, where we wasn't expected to get anything from the game because Miami are a big team in the USL and, and caused an upset and won one nil with a fantastic team goal. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, we played Pittsburgh at home and got a dramatic late e league late equaliser. So we arrived this week playing Real Monarchs at home. We have seven points from a possible nine. So it's been a really positive start. We, you know, we sit at the higher end of the table in the Atlantic division. Um, so, you know, we're being really, really positive. We're thinking really positive and we're taking each game as it comes, but it's been a really good start and we just want to keep going with that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Harry. And I know us at the, we at the World Affairs Council are going to be heading to a game soon too. So I know we'll see everyone out there um, and we're really looking forward to it. So thank you so much, Harry. And um, we will hear more from Harry uh, as we go. And it, right now, I'd love to turn it over to Stefan. I want to ask you if this is correct, because I heard that you wrote an article 22 years ago uh, that the Super League was an inevitability. I want to ask, is that true? Is that legend? And um, if it's true, how did you know? How did you know that this was, was going to happen? No, it's it's completely true. Uh, 22 years ago, I wrote a, a published an article about uh, a potential European Super League uh, with a co-author, Tom Hohen, um, published in an economics journal. And uh, for 48 hours, I looked quite prescient whilst it was actually still in the offing. Of course, it hasn't happened. So in some sense, by the forecast has not come to pass. But what the article was about was really basically setting out the rationale for a form of competition, which would involve more rivalry between big clubs in Europe. So in Europe, there are Many uh, leagues are organized on a national basis. So England has its leagues, Germany has its leagues, Italy has its leagues, Spain has its leagues. And they don't, so the, the big clubs in each of these leagues traditionally never met at all. From the 1950s onward, a competition was developed to enable these teams to meet called the European Cup, which turned into the European Champions League, which is um, the final of this is on uh, on Saturday, this coming Saturday, and it's normally seen as the pinnacle of the season. But still, this competition doesn't allow the very big clubs to meet very often. So, um, for example, if you think about a team like Liverpool and Bayern Munich, they may not have played each other in a proper competition for more than 10 years, which... And the idea behind a Super League is to really break, create a format within which these teams can play each other on a more regular basis. Because there's a huge, not just European, but global pent up demand to see these big teams and their big stars play for each other. Because remember, in the end, it's about the players. People want to see the players interacting with each other. So that was the so that's the that was the rationale 22 years ago. Actually, this idea first came up. Uh, well, it was first. So there were suggestions going back to the 1960s of doing this. This has been around in the air a long time, and the rationale seems quite sensible. Um, but it's not happened in this case again because and, and partly because of what Harry was saying was because of the nature of the system by which this was going to be introduced. 
Thank you, Stefan. And um, so my follow-up question would be the same question I asked Harry. What was your personal reaction, not only when you saw that the Super League uh, had been announced in 2021, um, but also the, when you realized that your prediction had, uh, as you said, mostly <laughs> come to pass? Well, so my initial reaction was to um, pick up the phone and start talking to the media about uh, why this was happening and what was going on. So, I, you know, it, it, in some ways, you know, I, I like soccer, I like sports, and um, I, 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 you know, I'm a fan up to a point. But bear in mind that I, as an academic, what I'm trying to do is really understand these systems and try and ex explain these phenomena, thinking about it from an economic perspective and thinking about what the economic rationale was. So what I was interested in was precisely the nature of the structure that they were being proposing to bring about this, and then the nature of the conflict which then ensued uh, between those who favoured this idea and those who were against it, and what the underlying reasons for that were. Excellent. Um, well, that brings us directly into our next question, um, which is uh, for a little bit of background, if um, some might not be familiar already, um, the Super League construct is based uh, in the principles of the U.S. closed league sports model. Um, so in your article in Foreign Policy, you argued that the, uh, quote, commercial reasoning was sound, but the culture clash doomed the plans. So can you outline for us where this essential clash of culture was? Um, what are some of the def defining factors of the American model uh, versus that European model? What was that essential uh, clash there? Right. So as, as I said, there's a clear rationale for a form of competition which will enable these big clubs to meet each other on a regular basis. And it will, it's worth billions of dollars, uh, literally billions of dollars of annual revenue for the teams. And the teams that were proposing to do this were also proposing to use a significant fraction of that money to provide a subsidy to smaller clubs which are currently struggling. So when I explain, describe this idea to, to for example, at the time I, I was still, uh, it was before the end of the semester, so I was teaching, and I, I, I put this to my classes, and I of American, predominantly American students, and said to them, what do you think about this? And they said, sounds great, everybody's a winner, what's the problem? Fans get what they want, money comes in, money gets shared out with people to people who need it, isn't this a good thing? And so when I explained to them why this was so anathema, it was, it was a real culture shock for them. And I think this is a general problem that uh, for Americans in often in understanding the nature of these competitions um, in Europe. And, uh, you know, I've been teaching here 10 years and I've, I've come across this problem on, on many occasions. So the fundamental distinction here to draw is between a franchise system, such as you have in the United States, and the um, open league system which they have in Europe. So let's go into that a little bit. So originally, the first leagues in any sport were actually formed in the United States. 1871 was the first ever league, something called the National Association of Professional Baseball that folded in a few years. And then the second ever league in the history of the world was in 1876, the National League in baseball, which still survives today as half of Major League Baseball. So it's also the oldest league in the world. And that was formed on a franchise system. So the, the founder of that league, a guy called William Holbert from Chicago, he offered exclusive territories and teams paid money for the right to have that exclusive territory. So it was a business transaction between the teams, the club owners, and the league uh, and the league owners. And that system evolved. And the idea that the club is the property of its owner became the, the organizing principle. Now, England was behind the United States in this and didn't develop its first league until 1888, which is the English Football League, which is the forerunner of the current league system in England, which includes the Premier League. But what happened in this English version was that after a few years, they decided that they wanted to allow other big clubs to compete with them. And so they created what was called a second class 
or a second division. And this second division, the teams that joined this were given the opportunity to rise up and play in the first class, the first division, if they won their championship at the end of the season. And the way that they ensured that that would happen was that the teams in the top division agreed that if they came bottom of the league, they would automatically go down to play in the second tier. And this system was established by the end of the 1890s in England. And this became globally the uniform template in soccer. Pretty much every soccer league that has more than one professional division has a what is called a promotion and relegation system. And as Harry was describing at the beginning, this means that no matter how lowly your team, you have the hope that one day you will rise up to the top and win the championship. And that's not just a pipe dream. Well, it is for most clubs, but it actually happened. As he mentioned in 2015, Leicester City, a team that was bankrupt and in the third level in the 2000s, actually won the Premier League. Very unexpectedly, it was a big shock, but it happened. And so it just shows that that hope is not a for completely forlorn hope. And that system is, in, in Europe, that there is an immense emotional attachment to that system. And that is something that people really, really care about. And that was the problem with the Super League proposal was they proposed, it, as, as Harry said, effectively to guarantee the participation in this Super League to the founder members, 15 of the founder members were going to be guaranteed a place. They would never be threatened by competition from lower rivals. And particularly in Britain, this just caused that everybody was opposed to this. Just, there was nobody who thought that this was a good idea. Just, you know, uh, I've, I've really seen Britain as united as it was in the opposition to this one, this one idea. And that's why it, ultimately they were, well, not ultimately, within 48 hours, they'd actually, the whole thing collapsed as the English clubs withdrew and said, you know, we can't be part of this. This is so anathema. And, 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 that, and as I say, that, I think this is a sort of a problem for Americans in many ways is, tr is, is, is feeling this because even now I've described it, I think for most Americans, you're going to say, huh, really? That sounds wacky, which if you didn't grow up in this culture, it does, I think. Thank you so much for, for outlining that cultural, the deep roots of the cultural uh, buy-in. And that is such a, a great way to explain and exemplify why the fan reaction that you just outlined was so strong. We saw world leaders, we saw uh, protests, we saw all of this ire and vitriol coming out in reaction to the announcement of the Super League. And thank you for explaining, you know, why that reaction was so strong. I think sometimes in the U.S., I should speak for myself, I, I was a little surprised at, at the reaction that it was so strong. Um, and that's really helpful to understand why that's so deeply rooted. So as we talked about some of the culture and that clash in, in the way that our leagues are, are set up, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more, because we have our sports economist here, we can't let you go without asking about the commercial and economic side of things. Um, so you wrote that the commercial um, model was sound and um, you, you spoke about the advantages of having a franchise system in terms of stability. I was wondering if you could share to some uh, who might not already be, be familiar what the financial model is right now for uh, European teams or particularly in England, uh, in, in Great Britain, I'm sorry. And, and why insolvency and uh, it maybe isn't such a, a risk or, or a fear that many fans have there, why that model works. Right, so again, what, so what, once, once, you start to, once you start to think about this system of promotion and relegation, it doesn't take long to start thinking of some problems. Now, the pro again, I, since I'm speaking to American audience, I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna describe this in a way that I think an American reaction, which based on my experience of talking to Americans about this. And so the first thing that Americans say is, well, the teams that get promoted will just be, there'll be uh, doormats, they'll get beaten and, and what, they'll be immediately relegated. That's not actually true. It, that, that's, not, that's not the way it works. Sometimes it's true, yes, but, but often, as the Leicester example shows, it, it isn't true. And that's because when teams go up, they can go into the market and buy players and, and they can get better. And when you go up, you get a bigger audience, you get more fans and so forth. 
the other thing that people say is that um, my my gosh, if uh, if the New York Yankees were relegated from Met to play minor league baseball, that would be a national disaster. You couldn't possibly think of that. And so that that means the system couldn't work. But the point about that is that teams that are the equivalent to the New York Yankees almost never get relegated. Or and really, when I say almost never, I mean over periods of more than half a century do not get relegated. Because the fact of the matter is that the big teams attract big revenues and they are able to make sure that they have the best players and therefore they are seldom uh, at risk of being relegated. To which then an American then responds to say, huh, you mean your, your leagues are completely dominated by a small number of teams. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. You have this extreme differences between dominant teams and underdogs. And that is true. There is this much bigger difference. There are none of the mechanisms that you see in the United States of salary caps, revenue sharing, and so forth, which serve to, to at least some extent, equalize competition amongst the teams. And so you had deeply unbalanced uh, 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 games in the league uh, uh, quite regularly, to which Americans say, well, surely nobody goes to watch this then, because that's really boring if you have these very unbalanced games. To which I then say, well, what is the most popular sport on the planet? <laughs> it's soccer. And these soccer leagues are immensely popular globally. So it can't be so very terrible if it's so popular. I, this is not a criticism of American sports. It's just to say that the idea that this wouldn't be popular seems to be belied by the fact of how popular it actually is. Now, Here's the real sort of uh, rub again for in terms of, of the problems that this has, the which where again, uh, again, I find an American audience reacts quite strongly, is that there is in this system almost no financial hope. You ask what is the financial model? The financial model is failure. The financial model is let's lose money and then let's lose some more money. That's the way the system works. And people sink immense fortunes into running these teams and then lose it all. And then that's that to an American, in my experience, says, well, but this is a business. How, how can you how can this work as a business proposition? Why doesn't it just collapse completely? Well, again, let's look at the facts of what happens across Europe. This season, in the last 15 months, actually, 52 teams in Europe have gone bust that we know of. In the uh, uh, Now, again, there are hundreds of teams in Europe, but uh, so that's just 52 out of very, about very many. But what I will, will place a bet with anybody is that almost every single one of those teams will survive. Because what happens is that when the team goes bust, somebody else buys it up. And this is because of what economists call amenity value. There is a value to owning a team which is not measured in dollars and cents, but is measured in prestige, glory, what have you. And re remember that these teams, and every town in Europe has a team, these teams are immense repositories of local pride. So if you step in and finance your local team, you are a hero. And there are enough people with money around who want to be the local hero to make sure that each team, every time a team goes bust, somebody steps in and takes it over. So that happens again and again in the soccer world. Now, I would argue this is actually quite good for the fans. Basically, what happens is rich people spend their money providing entertainment for fans. They lose money. They get prestige. Fans get entertainment. And that's a good system. The American system is seems to me one of in which the owners want it both ways. They want to be the heroes and provide the entertainment, but they also want to make money out of it and make a profit of it, which is to, to a European perspective. And I, you know, you, you grow up with the culture you're from. I'm European. Um, that just seems, to be honest, it actually seems quite wrong that it should happen like that. I understand the system. And after all, American sports are very popular. So in some sense, it works. But culturally, to me, it's not being stepping aside from the economics, it seems uh, like it's wrong. But, the, but the, from an economics point of view, 
what's interesting is both of these systems actually seem to work. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stefan. That is, uh, I think we have been seeing, you know, kind of one side or the other, which is this financial model versus this financial model. And I really appreciate seeing that, you know, there also is social capital and economic value in being that local hero. That's <laughs> very compelling. Um, I have a question in from the audience um, that I would love to pose. It, this is from Clive Thomas. This question is also a little over my head, so I'd love to pose it to you, Stefan. This uh, addresses sanctions and you know, a potential financial risk of that went into the Super League. So uh, Clive writes that the UEFA has already issued monetary sanctions against the clubs that voluntary withdrew, voluntarily withdrew from the ESL. Um, so today, the UEFA announced disciplinary proceedings and hearings against the three clubs, uh, Madrid, Barcelona, and uh, Juventus, that still harbor an expectation that the ESL will still be realized. So uh, Clive wants to know, what should be the appropriate sanction against these clubs? Do you uh, have any thoughts? And Harry, if you have any thoughts on this too, welcome, welcome your input as well. That, that's a great question. And um, what, one of the reasons why that's such a great question is, remember I said there were 15 clubs that were going to be in this league. Only 12 actually signed up and nine withdrew within 48 hours. So that leaves them. The three that are being threatened with sanctions or being sanctioned are the ones who have not withdrawn. So the question is, what role UEFA, that's the, the European governing body, what, what role they should take in this, how they should view this? Should they be, they, they've won. So should they be magnanimous in victory and just say, well, let's move on? Or should they mete out punishments to those who are still saying that one day they might want to do this? I think it's a very tricky decision. And again, so part of this, as you can probably tell, is going to be about public opinion. It's going to be about how people feel. And if it got to the stage that it felt that some of these clubs were being persecuted, that could start to turn people's views. That said, most people, most fans in Europe probably want to see these the, the Super Leaguers persecuted. So it strikes me that, that UEFA may well decide to go ahead with this. And in the end, the three clubs, Real Madrid, Juventus, um, and sorry, I forget was who the other one was, um, but uh, they, they will- Barcelona. Barcelona, yeah. I mean, these are very big clubs. They will survive. They will, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's still not going to add up to much more than a slap on the wrists. Excellent. Thank you. And I have one more audience question uh, I'd love to I'd love to bring in, which is what role do you think the large club, uh, I'm sorry, the large debts that most of the would-be Super League participants have amassed uh, played in this attempted breakaway? Um, and it goes on to ask, do you think the financial fair play has been a failure, uh, has been a net pos positive or negative in your view? So again, two, two, two very good questions. So in terms of the debt, actually most, most, again, one thing that doesn't happen in football is in soccer is that clubs have debts, generally speaking. And that they used to have, they used to borrow money from banks, uh, but they never paid it back. And, you know, your local bank cannot go and shut down your local soccer club. That is a way to lose all your customers. So banks lost money lending to football clubs, soccer clubs, and so, in fact, very few clubs are able to borrow money because the banks say, no, I'm not going to lend you any money. That said, some of the bigger clubs have borrowed money, particularly, for example, Tottenham uh, in London borrowed money to build a, a very grand new stadium. Um, uh, and um, uh, Arsenal have borrowed money. Um, Manchester United borrow money. So there are teams which borrow money, but mostly these clubs are wealthy enough that, that it's actually, the because they're the very biggest clubs, they, it's not really much of a problem. And, and indebtedness in general, compared to most businesses of those sides, is actually relatively low. Um, now, in terms of the second half of the question, um, this, gets, this gets more involved. I was very much an opponent of financial fair play when it came in. I, what you might guess from what I was saying earlier is that I'm a believer in unfettered competition. And as an, as an economist, what I believe is best is if there's unfettered competition, which has the consequence of driving down profits to zero. So when businesses make money, 
that's actually a bad sign. Capitalism isn't working well if businesses are making money. Capitalism works well when they are forced to cut their prices to the point where they don't make any money. Now they need to make enough to recover you know, basic costs and reinvest and so forth. But if they're making more than that, then actually that's a problem. So the fact that the fact that uh, the problem with financial fair play in my mind was that actually was helping them to make more money. And I don't think we should do that. We want capitalists to spend their money to benefit us, the consumers, not to fill their own pockets. Well, I know we are running up into our time limit, so I appreciate so much your, your time. Um, and I was hoping to pose two last questions before we um, before we wrap up. And one question is about the future. I know it's on everyone's minds. And Stefan, as someone who 22 years ago predicted uh, this happening, you seem uniquely suited to give us uh, some insights into what might be ahead in the future. So uh, these past few years, we have seen uh, Project Big Picture. Uh, we have seen in 2021, as we we're talking about today, an attempt to form a super league. Um, so what's next? Do you think that there's a new scheme in the works? Do you think that the eventual triumph of the Super League is inevitable? Um, what do you think might be in store for a future league format of soccer in Europe and then across the world? Right. So bear in mind, 22 years ago, I predicted a Super League and it still hasn't happened. So I've not been right yet, but I'm going to stick with my prediction. I'm going to predict that something along these lines is going to develop because I believe that there is pent up demand for this product. It is worth billions of dollars and that those billions of dollars represent the the interest of consumers. And so I think that should be met. And and I, I think uh, clubs will go on to find ways to do this. Now, setting against the background, bear in mind that one thing I've been saying is that, that effectively soccer has been bankrupt for 100 years, more or less, and it thrives. It's even more bankrupt now because of COVID. And the many of the clubs are in deep financial trouble. So the that what's likely to happen is, remember, what happens in bankruptcy is the current owners drop out and they're replaced by other people. So we're, going, we're likely to see a lot of new owners coming into, into soccer in, in, in the recent years. And one thing that's interesting is that some of these new owners have been um, private equity. Now, private equity's business model is to go in, sort out the problems, turn around the business and sell off a profitable going concern a few years later. Now that is a recipe for severe political conflict in the next five to 10 years, because anybody who tries to do that is immediately going to do what I've been saying is you want to turn it into a franchise system. You'd want to make it in a, a closed league system that is going to run into all the political opposition that the Super League did. So I think we're going to see this conflict come up over and over again. And what it may require in the end is it, it's quite possible that there will be government intervention just to mandate and say, no, this is part of the European tradition. This is the way we do things. You're not going to come in here and change this, because if you don't ultimately have that political control, if you get enough bankruptcy, then effective, then it's possible that one of these breakaway, a breakaway league might actually achieve this closed league system in, in Europe. Excellent, thank you. Um, thank you so much. And uh, our last question I have is a question to you, Stefan, and also to you, Harry. As we close out, I wanted to end on another global rift that has an uncertain future. Um, and Stefan, I know that you wrote uh, the recent work, It's Football, Not Soccer, about the linguistic rift between the word football and the word soccer. So as we're at odds over the Super League, uh, over financial models, can you also outline for us if you think uh, a, a brief history of the linguistic battle between football and soccer and ask, is there any hope of healing this divide, uh, this very specific, specific one? Do you think that ultimately one word will triumph over the other? There is a real divide over the organization and league structures in Europe and, and America. There should be no real argument though about what we call the game. And the one, it's, it's really interesting that um, uh, the, uh, the idea that soccer is not really a, an appropriate word to use to describe this game is something that is very recent. So I'm old enough to have grown up in a time in England when people used to call the game soccer. But 
when I was growing up, there was the same time that something called the North American Soccer League was popular in the United States in the, in the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s. And when this, this soccer league brought over many of Europe's biggest stars, and Europeans started to realize that Americans called it soccer. And in Britain, that led to a, 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 an exiling of this word from the language. Now, we know from the history that this was a word first coined in Oxford in the 1890s. So it's no, we know it's a British English word. But if you go into the internet and type in, it's football, not soccer, you'll find hysterical people, most of them sadly British, screaming that you must call it football and not soccer. And that's completely stupid. Soccer is a completely acceptable word to use. There's absolutely no reason not to use it, not least because the English who claim to know about, who claim to control of this language, although that's, that's a dubious claim in any case, but in any case, since we claim it's our language, we invented the word soccer, so we should certainly uh, cons consider it acceptable for Americans and anybody else who wants to use it to call the game by that name. Well, that is very generous of you, and uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate that, Harry. Do you agree, or do you come down on uh, strongly on one side or the other of the debate? Or are you uh, with Stefan that this is an opportunity for global healing, though the Super League question might still be up in the air? I'm um, I'm on the fence. I'm happy to I'm happy to call it whatever we need to call it. I'm going to leave you with a prediction of my own, actually, because I think you know the fact that Stefan predicted all of these things to come to fruition, I think is absolutely brilliant. And I've just been sitting here really enthralled by, you know, some of his, his knowledge that he has. My prediction in terms of what your last question was and what's coming next, I think that, so, so in England, in the Championship, League One, League Two, we have a playoff system um, where there is a space available to be promoted. So in the championship, as an example, the top two are promoted automatically. And then third, fourth, fifth and sixth will play two semi-finals and a final at Wembley. Now, my prediction uh, in the coming years in what could happen, and I think the little man wins, I think the big man wins, I think the leagues win, the TV companies win, is I think in the Premier League, they'll have a playoffs. And I think first, second and third will automatically get the Champions League spots. But I think the next four places will then compete for that last Champions League spot. And I think that would be incredible. I think the, the TV companies would, would love it. I think we as, as fans would love it. And that would then open up a situation where someone that finishes slightly lower in the table. So if we said fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh, that means the team that finished seventh, if they finish strong, they would happen to have an opportunity to come into this playoff system and potentially play in the Champions League if they won it. And you'd have the final at Wembley, like you do with the Championship playoff final. And I think it would be something which would be really interesting and could potentially, you could see that happening across more leagues other than just ours. So that would be one that I would leave you with, guys. But what I would say is I've really enjoyed listening to Stefan and his knowledge that he's given us today. Excellent. Well, I, it's been such a pleasure to have you, Harry, and to have you, Stefan. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, I don't know if you're willing, Harry, we can always propose this and send this new model to some, uh, some leadership and see if it starts here. Um, but most of all, I want to say a huge thank you. Um, once again, I can't wait to follow up. Uh, Stefan has a new book out, which is City of Champions. And if I heard uh, correctly, I, I believe you're also working on a new book on cricket, if, if that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's the next thing, which was um, until 1860, the most popular sport in the United States. Would you believe? We'll have to check those out. And Harry, I know that we'll be seeing you at a game soon, um, along with the fellow uh, World Affairs Council community, and we can't wait. Um, so, so thank you again. It's been such a pleasure to speak with both of you. And I want to turn it over to Megan, our, our CEO of the World Affairs Council. 
So just a quick thank you to everybody. So Stefan, I have the, um, as I said, I, I get to drive by Dillon Stadium on the on my way home every day and it's so exciting, but I also drive by Bushnell Park and they play cricket in Bushnell Park every Monday. So, so, so pretty cool city that we have here, really global. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Harry. We are so happy that you could join us for this fascinating discussion on the Super League. Thank you to the Hartford Athletic for your partnership and uh, thank you very much to Mr. Jeffrey Hoffman and the Hoffman Auto Group for your support of State of the World today. Thank you, everyone, and you have a great afternoon. See you on State of the World.